Hi everyone and welcome back. I wanted to just highlight the agenda that we have for the rest of the afternoon that we have. And also I did see a couple comments that have come through. We are recording our some seminar today. So please note that we are recording all these sessions and they will be available for on-demand viewing at a later time. Now I would like to move on to our next speaker. We are going to hear from Dr. Jacinda Sampson. She received a PhD in 99 in biochemistry and an MD in 2000 at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She completed her neurology residency in 2004 and neurogenetics fellowship with a focus on neuromuscular disorders in 2006 at the University of Utah. She is a neurogeneticist and a clinical professor of neurology at Stanford University. She has been an attending in adult and pediatric muscular dystrophy association um, care center since 2006. She offers transitional care for adults with neurogenetic disorders diagnosed in childhood and coordination of care in a medical home for patients with genetic disorders, most particularly the myotonic dystrophies. She also offers genetic counseling, testing, education, and care for family members at risk for neurogenetic disorders diagnosed in family members. She is the co-investigator on multiple clinic observational and treatment trials of myotonic dystrophies with the Stanford Neuromuscular Research Group. So Dr. Sampson, I will turn it over to you. You're very busy. So thank you for taking some time to be with us today. I'm going to try to summarize what's been happening in this really tumultuous past year in myotonic dystrophy research and in clinical trials. And I do have some disclosures. Um, I've done some consulting for some therapy uh, development with Ionis, Biogen, and Dyne. And I am an investigator or co-investigator on several clinical trials involving myotonic dystrophy and other muscular dystrophies and neuromuscular diseases. Um, but the relevant ones for today are Biogen, Ionis, Expansion, and AMO Pharma. Um, so 2020 was quite a year. I think we have all experienced it in different ways. It has changed all of our lives in, in so many facets. And while we've all been kind of concentrating on getting through and staying safe, I wanted to tell you what we've been doing in the world of, of clinical care and research to adapt to this new world with uh, COVID-19. So in mid-March, the world changed um, for all of us. And the first thing that most academic centers did was um, completely uh, revamp their hospital services to prepare for COVID-19 care. Um, this affected staffing, um, on-call staff. We're setting up um, second and third string call uh, uh, services in case the first line people got sick or they were overwhelmed. Um, all elective admissions and procedures were postponed or canceled and much of clinical research was considered elective. Essential treatments were prioritized. So if someone had a, a necessary surgery, such as a pacemaker implantation that can still go forward um, or cancer treatment that can still go forward um, with precautions. And uh, many different precautions were put in place um, such as uh, screening uh, patients, screening staff, uh, cleaning uh, labs, cleaning uh, workspaces, cleaning patient rooms, and distancing plans. And so patient volumes necessarily had to drop in order to keep these distances in place. Um, so on the clinical side, many of the non-essential workers were sent home to minimize exposure risk. And many parents with school-aged children had to stay at home um, to supervise their kids as they started their Zoom educational experience. Um, and patients chose to stay home, and this also reduced our patient volume. Um, but we tried to um, remain accessible by transitioning to telemedicine. And uh, we all did this as quickly as we could. Uh, many hospitals already had this in the works or in place. Um, but here at Stanford, I know that we, we flipped all of our patients from in-person to telemedicine in a week. Um, it was rocky. Um, the connectivity wasn't always good. Sometimes we couldn't hear or see each other well, um, but we, we muddied through all of that. And uh, I think we've gotten a lot better at it over the year. Um, but basic research was affected too. Um, 
often we think of it as kind of this ivory tower of research in white coats um, that's detached from the world, uh, but it really, it really had to change as well. Only essential research was uh, permitted to continue in the early phases, and this meant if you had uh, cells living in an incubator, you could go in and feed them, and if you had lab animals, you certainly needed to go in and feed them. Uh, but you had to work out a schedule where you wouldn't be in contact with other lab members and you had to have um, the personal protective equipment and isolation and distancing protocols in place. So many people finished their current experiments and then mothballed a lot of their research, froze down cell lines, packed things into the freezer uh, to wait until um, things could safely reopen. And I know at our institution, there were calls from the clinical side for materials, for personal protective equipment, and even PCR lab reagents so that the lab could do uh, testing for COVID. Uh, they were running out of the reagents to do the test. So um, Dr. Hagerman, uh, one of our, our researchers, was going around lab finding gloves and gowns and masks uh, that we had been using for research and um, dropping them off at the emergency room for use. So. Um, uh, it, it was an all hands on deck effort. So the number of people in lab were decreased and the amount of time they could spend in lab were decreased and this affected how you did and designed experiments. And even some of the core lab services and skilled technicians were redirected to COVID research. So um, if you had um, a clinical lab that was doing other things, they were often be re being redirected in order to develop those COVID-19 tests. Um, and uh, also pulled for other purposes. So, for example, in our clinical trials, our respiratory therapists were all hands on deck. Um, and uh, this was just a, 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 a meme that circulated on all of our, our team's uh, iPhones uh, or cell phones uh, during this phase, uh, encouraging all of our, uh, everybody not in the medical field, to please stay home. Uh, unless you wanted to be intubated by a neurologist, because that was our, our real concern is that we all have had, you know, in our medical school residency experience with ICU care, but it may be a bit distant for some of us. So it's better that we aren't pulled to the front lines and contribute in other ways if possible. Um, so, uh, so these were some of our worries early on. Um, but rapidly, um, things shifted and uh, everyone was looking at a way to continue to do research in a safe manner. And this took working together with um, the research participants. What did they feel comfortable doing? Um, the investigators, uh, what did they have the bandwidth to do? Um, the sponsors, um, because we needed to um, coordinate this among multiple centers and it would change you know, what we were doing and how we were doing it and materials and costs and a lot of other moving parts. And then our ethics board to make sure that what we were doing um, was ethical and safe and well thought through. Um, so as part of this in our, our next phases, many of our research coordinators were deemed non-essential and directed to work from home. So you might have interacted with them less in person and more on telemedicine or on the phone. And uh, like I said, our pharmacists and respiratory therapists were getting pulled for clinical care. Just having the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy, all of us as physicians considered myotonic dystrophy patients to be at high risk of a more severe uh, COVID uh, experience. Uh, were they to contract that virus than the average person due to the underlying multi-systemic nature of the disease, especially the cardiac and pulmonary involvement? And then some of our study patients, because this is a genetic disorder and multiple family members might be affected, they may feel that their health is good and that they are strong, but they may have at-risk family members. And so sheltering in place, not only to protect themselves, but to protect their family members was a priority and certainly important. And then um, there were travel restrictions at a state level or county level uh, for, uh, uh, advisories to not travel, and this included our study monitors as well as our staff. So there were a lot of elements that had to change in order to adapt to the COVID uh, 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 pandemic. 
And over time, uh, working with all of these different moving parts, um, our institution was able to resume most of our clinical trials um, that were treatment trials in about August. And we're you know, also able to resume in conjunction with clinic visits, some of the observational studies. Um, but every institution has been different at different rates and different regions have had different levels of COVID-19 infection. And so different precautions are proper and suitable in different locales. So it really has been um, moving the chess pieces forward bit by bit. And I think we all um, are looking around the world at some of these resurgences uh, that have been happening in the past few weeks and realizing how important these measures are, not just vaccination, but uh, distancing, screening, and testing uh, in order to minimize spread so that we don't have a resurgence at this 11th hour now that vaccines are available. So um, we have rapidly transitioned to a virtual world in so many ways. Uh, we've changed many of the visits from in-person to video visits. Um, we're more flexible in allowing missed or rescheduled visits. Um, if there are impediments due to travel or um, uh, having to quarantine. Um, our monitors are visiting us by video. Um, we're maintaining all of our privacy uh, options as before, or privacy precautions as before. We're even now allowed to do informed consent by video and telephone in some cases. And uh, we've outsourced blood draws to local labs and sometimes even home lab draws uh, with uh, uh, nursing agencies. Um, which also are having staffing difficulties because of the high demand for uh, skilled nurses. Um, and so things are starting to resume and we're hoping that looking forward we're going to be able to uh, do more of this translational uh, clinical treatment oriented research. But it has had an impact and uh, this is a bit of like watching an eclipse uh, of the sun where there has been a steady uptick in uh, publications on the myotonic dystrophies year by year until 2019. Um, there has been growing interest and breadth of knowledge about the myotonic dystrophies and then 2020 hit. And the number of publications dropped in 2020. And in this year, we're only, you know, late April. So consider that that number of 15 is only a quarter of the year about but we're on track to be a lot lower than 2019. Um, and there are fewer clinical trials than there have been in previous years uh, being published. But this doesn't mean that there isn't high quality data coming out and important discoveries that have been made. And I think we're moving out of this uh, kind of COVID eclipse of research finally and starting to see more information. Some of the things that, um, uh, people have been doing in this year of COVID have been going back and looking at uh, chart reviews, uh, case reviews, applying new approaches uh, of analysis such as machine learning and artificial intelligence to existing data sets, um, uh, starting to reach out uh, to patients virtually with uh, questionnaires uh, and patient reported outcomes. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that people have continued to do research um, uh, at a distance and with existing data. So things have not come to a complete frozen stop. People have been busy this past year. Um, and so here are some, uh, uh, I was also going to mention that other remote monitoring uh, studies have been uh, published and are in progress. So not only uh, questionnaires remotely and telemedicine visits, but um, uh, getting uh, information at home uh, with actigraphy, which uh, you may be more familiar with as something like an ActaWatch uh, or a Fitbit or an Apple Watch uh, to monitor activity. Uh, but there's also been a lot of other research about how to do research by telemedicine and with these uh, data collection uh, techniques at home. So I picked a few 
papers that have come out in the past year. And I tried to focus on things that had clinical relevance in the observational studies um, that could change clinical management now and are things that we can do something about now. Um, and I also wanted to focus on some of the multi-systemic involvement um, that Dr. Gutman referred to, um, that uh, there's important clinical research going on in areas outside of the muscle research. And this is one that I think Dr. Gutman uh, referred to uh, in her talk about cancer and cancer risk. It's, it's controversial, this is new data, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this, um, but there have been publications by this same group. Um, uh, uh, this is a publication uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Ritana Asagav and uh, Shainaz uh, Gadella. Um, they're with the uh, National Cancer Institute. Uh, and they also worked with the University of Maryland, Kennedy Krieger Institute, and Johns Hopkins on this study. Now, what was interesting is that this is actually a data review uh, of a clinical uh, 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 records of, from primary care from the United Kingdom. And it goes, it starts in 1987 and uh, the database, you know, was, you know, the last data that they analyzed was the 2016 data release. Um, and so they looked through this to look at uh, cancer risk initially in 2018, and they did see with this database an increased risk of cancer, uh, not rare or uh, unusual cancers, but some of the common cancers, uh, particularly thyroid, uterine cancer, and melanoma in their particular study. There have been other studies that have suggested that there can be increased risk of cancer and myotonic dystrophy in some other uh, common cancers, uh, including ovarian cancer, uh, brain cancer, uh, and you know possibly colon uh, and testicular cancer. Um, one of the things this group reported, the reason this was an interesting sub-analysis, again, they went back and they looked at their data in a more granular fashion, is that in the general population, there's an increased risk in people who don't have myotonic dystrophy, who do have diabetes, of certain common cancers, particularly breast, colon, and endometrial. Their question was, is this also true in myotonic dystrophy type 1? There have been some suggestions that metformin might be protective in diabetics in helping decrease the incidence of cancer. And their question was, is this also true? in myotonic dystrophy patients with diabetes who are treated with metformin. So the first thing that they did was they matched 20 to 1 the myotonic dystrophy patients to uh, controls. And they matched them for age, sex, which clinic they attended. They also matched them for other cancer risks, such as smoking and alcohol use. Um, and you couldn't have cancer at enrollment and you had to have been followed for a certain amount of time. It wasn't just a one clinic visit thing. So they did some very careful um, screening of the data. And what they found uh, were a, a validation of what, what Dr. Gutman already described that we already knew is that there is an increased risk of type two diabetes and myotonic dystrophy type one than in controls. And this is likely due to uh, the uh, uh, change in splicing in the insulin receptor that occurs due to the effects of the repeat expansion in this disease. So what they found was that the myotonic patients who had diabetes were more likely to develop cancer than the myotonic patients without diabetes, and that they did show some signal towards a protective effect of metformin. However, in the same paper, they found no effect of metformin in the non-myotonic patients, um, and they did not confirm an association between diabetes and cancer in the controls. So it was a mixed picture, but it was a suggestion that there might be some more meaning here that could be replicated in other data sets, 
but it does emphasize from a preventive precautionary measure, as Dr. Gutman said, do your cancer screening. Having myotonic dystrophy doesn't mean you can't get other common things. And cancer is not all that uncommon. So please get your mammograms, um, get your colonoscopies when it's time. Um, your physician, when he sees you on your annual exam, should be feeling your thyroid. If your thyroid tests are abnormal, having a thyroid ultrasound to look for that is also relevant. Um, and as Dr. Gutman said, many things can be linked to myotonic dystrophy, not everything is. So if something feels abnormal or out of, not typical for you, you know, please talk to your doctor about it because whether it's myotonic related or not, it probably still should be investigated. So uh, this was, I felt, a, a, a relevant paper for um, everyday life in clinical care. There was another paper that I thought was very interesting and relevant, um, which is uh, looking at uh, bone fractures. And this was in men. So, uh, and it looked at both myotonic dystrophy type one and type two. It wasn't a very large study, but I thought it was uh, pretty significant. Um, most of us commonly think of osteoporosis and uh, fragility fractures as being a risk for postmenopausal women. However, Anybody who has muscular dystrophy has a tendency towards lower bone density, even when you're young. And this is part of, because gravity affects your bone density, it's a weight-bearing exercise, which you might not do as much of if you have a muscular dystrophy. And also the push and pull of the muscles on your bones helps the bones remodel and become more dense. Um, all can affect your baseline bone density. Um, but there's other factors as well that I'll go over. So they looked at 36 myotonic dystrophy type one men and 13 men who have myotonic dystrophy type two, and they inquired about the history of fracture and they did DEXA scans. So DEXA scans are basically a bone survey scan that takes a very low amount of radiation, but it gives you a huge amount of information about your bone density in your, uh, usually looking primarily in your lower back, or uh, the top of your hip bone. And what they found is that osteopenia, so osteoporosis means pathologic, really severe decreased bone density. Osteopenia means definitely lower than normal bone density. And they found that this was frequent, particularly in myotonic dystrophy type two patients. And that this correlated not with muscle strength, but with decreased muscle mass, it also uh, um, correlated with low testosterone level, which we know is associated with both myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2, and um, gonadal failure, which is spermatogenesis. Um, it also correlated, here we are again, with insulin resistance. And this was not only diabetes, but pre-diabetes, and that there was more osteopenia in people who were overweight or obese which sounds counterintuitive because some people think if you have more weight on your bones that your bones would be more dense. In fact, it is the opposite. So um, this, uh, uh, this paper I thought uh, was uh, particularly relevant uh, to patient care. Um, this was a study done uh, in Milan uh, by Dr. Passeri and Dr. Corbetta. The, Things that I wanted to emphasize as well with this paper was that the fractures weren't in the typical places you would think. You think of osteoporosis fractures as being at the wrist if you fall and try to catch yourself or at the hip if you fall and hit your hip. This is not where those fractures were. They were in the bones of the feet, um, part, two of them in the metatarsal or the ankle. And there were even uh, fractures in the mandible and and in the ribs. Now you could understand the ribs with a fall. Um, and they occurred at uh, middle age. So uh, individuals in their 40s, and there was uh, one fall and fracture of the radius and elbow in a 16 year old. Uh, and 11% of the type one myotonic dystrophy individuals had a fracture. And in individuals with type two, it was 15%. This is a pretty big number. Um, 
the things that are modifiable factors are not only um, low testosterone and diabetes as mentioned here, but they also observed that vitamin D levels were uh, measurably low in a third approximately of both type one and type two individuals. There was a low, lower than FDA recommendations for calcium intake in approximately a third of both groups. Um, and uh, we already talked about the low testosterone level, which is something that could be replaced if you are seen by an endocrinologist or your, your neurologist and you've been tested and found to have a low testosterone level. So this is something that um, definitely can, can be, a, I, I think, a modifiable risk factor. So uh, I thought that was a particularly important paper. Um, in the past year, there has been a lot of interest about CRISPR. Um, uh, many people have probably heard about the two babies in China that have been born who underwent CRISPR treatment uh, pre-implantation to help protect them from HIV infection, uh, which has turned out to had, have some ethical questions as well as some off-target effects that might not have been expected. And so many people have been asking me, where is CRISPR at? in um, development for clinical trials in myotonic dystrophy. And here's another disclaimer. I am not an expert in CRISPR. I am a fan of, of CRISPR technology and research, but there may be questions that I'm not able to answer. But just a general overview of, of what CRISPR is about is that this is um, a, uh, a molecular mechanism uh, that was first discovered uh, in, um, uh, not in humans, not in eukaryotes uh, or, or, or mammals, uh, but it is um, uh, a defense that has evolved uh, to uh, cut and paste DNA. Uh, so uh, there's two parts to it. Um, the Cas9 part that you'll hear a lot about is the scissors that cut DNA, DNA being in the nucleus, the library that holds all of your, your uh, 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 genetic information. And that Cas9 scissor um, needs uh, a pattern or a template or a guide, and there, it's called a guide RNA. And so this guide RNA matches up with the DNA and it directs the Cas9 scissors where to cut. And that cut is a double-stranded cut. It's not, so DNA is, D is for double-stranded. Um, and there's one strand that you uh, inherit from mom and one strand that you inherit from dad. And what it, you get with the guide RNAs is a, uh, that template binds to both the, the strand you inherited from your mom and your dad. And it cuts not just one of the uh, part of the latter, but all the way through. So the DNA gets separated completely. So how do you put it back together is partly regulated by that guide RNA, but there can be other rearrangements that happen. It could stick to another double-stranded break somewhere else. Um, it could flip or rearrange in another manner. And so one of the things this group by uh, Mosbach and his team found, and this is something that has been known but not always well studied in the history of CRISPR is that uh, the CRISPR scissors can lead to not only the modification that you want, but modifications that you don't want, where the DNA rearranges in ways that you didn't direct it to. So this has created some concerns about using CRISPR in people, that these rearrangements might lead to cancer or affecting some other important gene that shouldn't get disrupted. So some groups have um, targeted the RNA. So RNA is the message from your DNA that carries the recipe for how to make a protein. Um, and one of the nice things about targeting the RNA is it doesn't leave a permanent inheritable change in your genetic material in the nucleus it modifies the recipe for building your proteins. So it can be more easily turned on, turned off, modified without the, the long lasting change to your genomic DNA. 
And so um, this is uh, information uh, uh, done in Dr. Yao's lab, Gene Lau. I love that his first name is Gene and he works on genetics. And he's at UC San Diego. And this group at San Diego, along with uh, Dr. Batra and Dr. Nellis, um, who were the graduate students working on the project, have been looking at uh, CRISPR that targets RNA instead of DNA. And they're looking at it in a transgenic mouse model. And uh, what they're doing is they're introducing it into the mouse shin muscle, the tibius, tibialis anterior muscle, the one that for you in the human would be the one that lifts your ankle up. Um, so they're injecting this uh, uh, CRISPR uh, system into the muscle. So how are they doing that? How do they get it there? Um, well, they're packing it in a viral capsid. So AAV, adeno-associated virus, is um, uh, a, um, it's like a, it's like a cold virus um, in that you can pack a small amount of DNA in it, not a huge amount. Um, in other words, you can fit the scissors of the CRISPR system in there, but you can't jam in the guide RNA as well. Um, there are groups working on um, miniaturizing the uh, scissors and guides to fit into the same capsid, but right now, this is the, the route that they went. And so you had to put the guide RNA in its own little viral capsid and the scissors in another, and then you co-transfect, meaning you need to get one of each into the muscle cell in order to get the whole system there. So they did this and they actually had very good success. Um, they tried both intramuscular injections and intravenous injections. They tried newborn mice and then also adult mice who already had symptoms. And what they found is that this was not just a short-term thing, that the RNA didn't come and go in a couple of weeks, um, that they were able to see effects three months later. So this is something that might not need to be retreated on you know, a weekly or more common basis. This might have some durability to it. And the things that they looked at to show effectiveness, um, I'll show you up here in this corner, is that they saw that, um, they saw some partial changes in the RNA splicing that we think leads to a lot of the abnormalities in myotonic dystrophy in a quarter of the RNA, so they, uh, but 61% normalized. So this is a pretty good effect. They also found that they were able to get um, uh, this system, both the, the scissors and the guide, in about 50% of the muscle cells on the injection study. And looking at the muscle at three months, uh, the MBNL protein, the one that sticks to the repeat expansion that we think is necessary for your RNA to splice correctly, um, unclumped and had a more normal looking distribution. Those clumped RNA in the nucleus that are where the M MBNL gets stuck on the uh, repeat expansions were decreased in number. The splicing shifted back towards normal. That's what this pie chart shows in the blue and the yellow. That was what normalized and what partially responded. And even the mouse myotonia improved. So these mice actually get mouse paw grip myotonia. And myotonia you can hear on an EMG. So if you put a needle in the muscle of the mouse, you hear the same EMG changes that you hear in a human. Uh, and that responded uh, significantly to the treatment. So this, this I thought was a, a really encouraging study uh, because I think from the FDA's perspective, they've already approved a different strategy with the antisense oligonucleotides to bind and uh, bring down or decrease RNAs, that targeting RNAs in, with other approaches has already been FDA approved for other diseases and other methods. So even though this is a different system, targeting the RNA is generally considered to probably be safer than targeting the DNA. And so this might be moving towards clinical trials sometime when the eclipse is over and the sun is back out. So let me tell, tell you a little bit about the clinical trials that have um, uh, been going on during this uh, COVID pandemic, or at least have been published during this COVID pandemic year, which means 
basically all the data was collected pre-pandemic. Um, and let me go over a little bit about clinical trials and the terminology because this will be on the slides a lot. Um, you may already be familiar with this from other talks and lectures, but um, just so we're all on the same page. A natural history study means um, there isn't any treatment being done. Uh, what's being done is to observe myotonic dystrophy over time uh, in order to see what is changing. And this could be different organ systems. It could be the myotonia, it could be the muscle strength, it could be the heart function, it could be your breathing capacity. Um, but the what you measure and how you measure it is really important in order to design a trial later. If we don't have something that we can follow change in, we can't tell if we've changed it with the treatment. So this is really, really essential for us to be able to say, this is how we're going to design a trial. How many people do we need? What are we going to measure? And how long are we going to measure it for? And how big an effect are we going to expect to see or need to see in order for something to be clinically meaningful, meaning it matters to you. It just doesn't look different on a gel or on a blood test, but it makes a difference in how you feel and what your you know, function is. So the natural history studies are a really important part of, of our clinical research. And, and that is also what's meant by observational. Observational means that there is not a drug or other treatment. And it's not necessarily over time. It might be just one visit or one observation. An intervention means that someone is trying to change or improve your uh, uh, symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. Um, and this could be a drug, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so uh, you'll hear a little bit later about uh, approaches that are therapies, and it could be a physical therapy, an exercise plan, uh, or it could be a cognitive therapy, which would be coaching uh, or uh, lifestyle changes uh, in order to have new patterns of of um, incorporating exercise or other things in your life. Um, so other terminology, placebo controlled, means that everybody is getting something that looks like a drug, but some get the active drug, but some get a placebo. And a placebo is an inactive treatment um, that's meant to look like the active drug. So it'll be matched in, in its color, in its taste, in its you know, formulation. And, uh, and that's what a placebo is. Uh, randomized means that um, uh, you as a, a participant and your physician don't have any, any uh, role in which arm you're being assigned placebo or uh, treatment arm. Uh, it's done by chance uh, using uh, uh, basically a computer um, randomization process. Double blind um, means uh, there's two people who don't know what you're getting. <laughs> One is you <laughs> as the participant and the other is your doctor. Your doctor does not know either. Um, you might think based on your side effects or effects or how you feel, what you may suspect you might be on treatment or not, but we really don't know. And sometimes the things that you think are a side effect of the treatment or not, um, can just happen in ordinary individuals at, at some point in their life. So for example, if I'm on a study and I have worsening constipation, is it really the medication or is it because I've, you know, if I have myotonic dystrophy, I also get constipation from, from that too. So um, double blind uh, means neither the physician nor the participant know the treatment arm. And then an open label extension is a, is a study design where um, uh, the participant can continue on in the study if they choose, they don't have to, um, and be switched over from the placebo arm to the treatment arm. Um, so that uh, if you are a participant in a study like this, you know that for the six months of the double blind part, you won't know if you're getting medication or not. But as long as everything is looking safe in the, and there aren't any severe side effects at that end of the period, um, if there isn't any reason to stop everybody from getting treatment, you might be able to con 
switch over to the study drug uh, while the sponsor is doing the math on the outcome measures and uh, applying to the FDA for approval. It doesn't guarantee it will be approved by the FDA. Not every study has an open label extension. So that's just part of how different studies are designed differently. And then there's different phases. So you'll hear phase one, phase two, phase three, even phase four. Um, and so what this means is phase one is usually in healthy controls. And what, they're, what you're doing at that phase is you're, you're, you're investigating what are side effects. If you take a certain amount, how much of it is in your blood or in your tissues? How fast does your body turn it over and get rid of it? So you really need this information to know um, what's, what dose you're going to start with. Pardon my hiccups. Um, and this is based on animal models and in vitro information. So it's not just a guess. There's you know, a lot of biochemistry behind choosing the doses for the phase one study. And then phase two is a small study uh, looking at uh, people who do have a particular disorder. And so the questions they're asking there are still, is it safe? Um, what are the side effects? And is it effective? And you can still, you will still follow things like blood levels uh, and metabolism there too, which is the name for that is pharmacokinetics. Um, and then phase three is the definitive trial. It's in a large group of people with a particular disorder. And the primary question is, does this work? Is this better than standard of care? And standard of care might be no treatment, you know, supportive care from your physician, preventive care, or it might be the current standard of care. So if you were looking at a, for example, a blood pressure medication and you wanted to ask, is this better than the current treatment? Because in that case, you wouldn't want the hypertensive patients to not take an antihypertensives because there is a current treatment for high blood pressure. So you would compare it to the standard of care treatment arm. Currently, though, we don't have a treatment for the myotonic dystrophies that slows or reverses disease. So this is why placebo arms are still incorporated in these studies. Um, so here is the first uh, uh, um, clinical trial I would like to go over. Um, uh, this has been long anticipated and long in the works, and uh, um, you may if you have myotonic dystrophy, you may have heard of this study or, or know someone who is in it. And this is um, a study done by um, Chad Heatwell and Dr. Moxley with Rochester Group. And it's a study of mexilatine. And mexilatine is in the family of lidocaine. Uh, and what it does is it stabilizes um, membranes and it acts on sodium channels. And it currently is approved to be used as a cardiac antiarrhythmia drug. So if you're taking this to treat your uh, myotonia, your grip myotonia or myotonia elsewhere, this is you know, something that is part of why you're going to get an annual EKG or inter interval EKGs as part of your standard clinical care. But we always look at those to see whether it's um, having uh, any effect. And so that was one of the questions here is, you know, what are the effects of mexilatine on heart rhythm in individuals who are taking it for myotonia. And, but the other question was also, does this help slow the progression of myotonic dystrophy or does it help in other myotonic dystrophy symptoms? Um, so uh, this was a pretty thorough study. There were a lot of things that they looked at in order to identify whether or not there was progression. So there were 42 people who uh, enrolled and the average age was 42. You had to be over 18 and have adult onset myotonic dystrophy type 1. Um, and uh, you received treatment for six months. The dose was 150 milligrams three times a day. And the primary outcome measure was the, um, the classic six minute walk test distance. So basically, um, there is a, a, a track set up in a hallway. Uh, your physical therapist or your study coordinator has a timer and see how far can you walk in six minutes safely. Um, other things that they looked at were the grip strength in the hand, how fast can your hand open uh, with a video uh, monitor, um, other, 
uh, things such as your swallowing function, your lung capacity, um, how quickly can you walk up uh, four steps, um, and some questionnaires about how do you feel that it's working? Are you having any side effects? Um, but also very importantly, looking at the ECG um, and your Holter monitor. And so um, one of the things that they found was, unfortunately, there was not any difference in the six minute walk distance, um, but there was an improvement in the grip myotonia, um, but the patient report didn't really pick up a difference. Um, the beneficial thing was there wasn't any effect seen on cardiac side effects, um, but there were some side effects that, and dizziness and upset stomach were the most common side effects, and there were some more frequent falls in this group, and I don't know if that was related to dizziness or not. They weren't sure. Um, uh, but it did seem to have a, a, a measurable difference on hand relaxation time, which this is the um, uh, mexilatine treatment in blue. Is uh, This was faster hand relaxation and in placebo, uh, not, not responding to the placebo. So, so that was an important trial. Um, another trial um, that was published this past year was a multi-center study uh, looking at uh, AMO02, which is uh, tadeglucib, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, um, in uh, children with uh, congenital or childhood onset myotonic dystrophy. So what is AMO02 or tadeglucib? Um, it inhibits an enzyme, uh, which is uh, GSK3B, that's a kinase. It basically is involved in intracellular signaling in the brain, but also a lot of other tissues. And it is a drug that can get into your whole body, into your brain, into your spinal fluid, which means that it can have a potential effect on some of the central nervous system symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. Um, in mouse models, they showed that uh, treatment with tadeglucid decreased um, the amount of RNA with the expanded repeat in uh, DMPK, and in mice, it helped improve some of the behavioral changes that they see in the transgenic mice. So this was an early phase study. It's a phase two study, and it was single blind, but it was placebo controlled. Um, and it was uh, performed in uh, the uh, United Kingdom and in Canada, just two sites. Um, and their uh, participants were between age 13 and 34, so it included adults, but you had to have onset of your symptoms in childhood or uh, congenital. Um, it was a 12-week treatment, so four months, not very long, but they did compare two different doses, 400 milligrams and 1,000 milligrams. And they got some um, uh, in, uh, encouraging results. So uh, one of the outcomes that they did was an interview of the clinician with the participant and uh, what is called the domain-specific causes for concern, basically going through the different multisystemic manifestations of myotonic dystrophy with the participant asking, how are you doing with this? Is this worse? Is this better? So it could be your fatigue, it could be your GI tract, it could be cardiac, any of these. And so uh, that showed a trend of improvement over time uh, that seemed to be uh, more certain at the higher dose. And it was also true for the clinician global impression scale. So not only does the participant feel like they're doing better, but the clinician thinks they see that too. So, um, so that was uh, an encouraging study that was published uh, this past year. And then Another study that I think um, is in the realm of, you know, finding new and better biomarkers is this uh, study that was uh, a, a sub-study of the optimistic study. So if you hadn't already heard of the optimistic study, this was a multi-center study performed in the United Kingdom and European Union at multiple sites. Um, patients were randomized to standard clinical care versus um, sessions um, with cognitive behavioral therapy. And the goal of the cognitive behavioral therapy were um, to encourage exercise and to address apathy 
both of which um, you heard from Dr. Gutman are, are, uh, are really important in uh, myotonic dystrophy. And if it seemed suitable, an, an exercise plan that was designed by a physical therapist. So this was a sub-study, so not everybody in the optimistic study underwent uh, the imaging study. Uh, but imaging is, I think, an excellent biomarker. Uh, and when I say biomarker, we're looking for other measures of, of response to therapy in a clinical trial that might give us signals earlier than our more standard outcomes, such as how far can you walk in six minutes or how strong is your grip strength, that maybe we can see changes earlier and therefore we can have shorter studies um, or not have to enroll as many patients if we can have these other biomarkers indicating that we're going in the right direction with the therapy. So, so this was really important for developing that. Um, so there were 27 people who had these MRI scans. Um, their average age was 45, so adults, um, and uh, they had to um, have their uh, imaging done uh, at baseline and at 10 months. And so how on earth do you quantitate this? So this is a diagram that shows a little bit about what the images look like and how they did it. So when you do a scan of your leg, they did the whole leg, and then they basically looked at kind of these cross-sectional areas of the leg muscles. And here you can see one of those cross-sections and they outlined them and quantitated the volume of all the different muscles in, these, in the leg, going up and down the leg. And then they looked for some changes that you can see uh, in muscle that is being affected by muscular dystrophy by myotonic dystrophy. You see changes in the muscle over time. This is that progressive loss of muscle strength, muscle mass, that with that you also can see um, brightness on T2, which means there's edema or increased fluid or swelling, uh, but also increased fat, that as muscle is lost, it gets replaced by fat cells and also something called fibrosis, which is connective tissue or scar tissue. And so even if there is a volume of muscle that you can detect, it might not all be muscle cells in that area. There may be fat and connective tissue that's taking up part of that space that isn't helping with the strength of that muscle. So what they found in their participants, and again, going back to Dr. Gutman's uh, note that exercise is good, um, is that the participants who uh, uh, engaged in physical activity increased, this isn't just a slowing a progression of disease or a plateau, they increased their muscle cross-sectional area on average by 4.2%. I know that doesn't sound like a big number, but this wasn't a very long study either. Imagine over time, this might have even more benefit. And the, they noted that muscles that still had some muscle volume, muscle strength, were more apt to respond than muscles that were extremely weak or had a lot of fat and um, scar tissue replacement. So uh, the muscles that still have strength can help maintain or even improve their strength. So this was, I thought, an exciting thing. So the next study was presented as a poster, and I'm going to give my disclaimer, I was one of the investigators on this study, um, looking for uh, treatments of fatigue in myotonic dystrophy type one. And this was a multi-center study, um, also with Dr. Goodman, but also other centers at University of Florida, Sleep Medicine Specialists of Florida, and it was sponsored by Expansion Therapeutics. So there have been, um, off-label reports uh, that flumazenil, which is a medication that we use uh, in anesthesia to reverse uh, sleepiness from drugs like benzodiazepine family, like Valium, that some off-label reports that this helps in myotonic dystrophy type 1 fatigue. Um, and it has been published that it has, is effective for idiopathic hypersomnia, which is basically daytime sleepiness of unknown cause without underlying myotonic dystrophy, so that does exist. 
um, and it's a selective antagonist. Now, one difficulty with flumazenil is it has a really short half-life in the blood. You give it as an injection and then not too long later, it's out of your system. So in this study, they had two cohorts, two groups, two phases. One was at a low dose of a milligram and another was at a higher dose at two milligrams. It was double-blinded. I didn't know, the participant didn't know, it was randomized, but everybody came in for one visit for a placebo treatment and one visit for a treatment arm, but we didn't know which, and it was a crossover design. So they came in twice, once for a placebo and once for a treatment. You had to be sleepy to be in the study or have excessive uh, nighttime sleep, but you did have to have treated your sleep apnea. Your uh, myotonic symptoms had to have started uh, in adulthood. Um, and unfortunately, no matter how we analyzed this, this was a negative study. We did not see a difference between the IV injection of flumazenil and placebo at any of the time points over the four hour study period in the Stanford sleepiness scale, which is a self-report of how sleepy people felt, the psychomotor vigilance test, which is how alert were you and, and your reaction times, or the patient or global impression scale. So patients and clinicians stating whether they felt like the patient was doing better or not did not correlate with the placebo versus the treatment arm. Um, so this particular study unfortunately was negative, but there are other studies in development for other uh, treatments of fatigue and sleepiness. Um, and uh, for persons who are, uh, uh, um, feel that they're benefiting from flumazenil in the off-label use uh, with other formulations, oral and topical, um, uh, this, this doesn't uh, contradict their experience of, of feeling, feeling an improvement, but certainly more work needs to be done in this area. Okay. So what's coming up? Um, I'm going to give you some websites uh, to find out what is the future of myotonic dystrophy research, if you're interested in being involved or just interested in more information. And I think one of the most comprehensive websites is the clinicaltrials.gov website. You can uh, do a web search here on all of the research going in the United States and some outside the United States uh, trials, um, and you can restrict it by condition or disease. So you can type in myotonic type 2 if that's your interest, or myotonic type 1. However, please, please read carefully once you get the literature search. It's not the most perfect filter. And unfortunately, DM1 not only means myotonic dystrophy type 1 to us in the MDA world, it also means type 1 diabetes in the general medicine world. And so that abbreviation is used for both those disorders. T DM2, again, we use that term for myotonic dystrophy type 2. However, it's also used as an abbreviation for type 2 diabetes, which is really confusing because, as we talked about in the cancer study, uh, myotonic dystrophy patients can also have type 2 diabetes, and that's an important research topic. So just read the fine print. Or if you don't want to spend the time reading the fine print, there's some really excellent tools on the MDA website as well. Um, go to their uh, cl clinical trial finder tool on their website and you can enter in um, more information about what you're looking for and where you live to see what's near you. Um, and then I also am going to refer you to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website and Clinical Trial Research Center. If you click on the current trials and studies here, that is actually a hyperlink. It doesn't look like it, but it is. But it also nicely has some other resources. So if you have questions about what does she mean by phase one or phase two or crossover or repeated measures or you know, any, any of these aspects of, of research trials, um, there's some uh, informational videos there that can be helpful. So currently enrolling studies, um, the Today Glucid is currently enrolling in their next phase study, phase two, phase three. It's a 22 week study. It's a multi-center trial. And they're looking at the uh, uh, changes in uh, uh, symptoms, but also looking for safety data. And I realize I'm running out of time. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, and then I talked about how important natural history studies are. 
And so NDM1, a study of myotonic dystrophy type 1, um, is also enrolling uh, to find these outcome measures and biomarkers uh, to develop uh, better clinical trials. Um, there are also some natural history studies being done at different centers for myotonic dystrophy type 2, uh, Wake Forest and Boston are some. Uh, and uh, here is the um, NIH natural history study and looking for biomarkers and endpoints. They're enrolling both type 1 and type 2. They're looking for 180 people. Uh, and this is also on the clinicaltrials.gov website. So uh, while we have been in a bit of an eclipse with clinical research and clinical trials, we are coming out of the shadow into the light and going forward, we are applying all of those measures that we used in the COVID pandemic to make our clinical research more efficient and uh, more adaptable. So analyzing previous samples and data, applying new tools like machine learning, um, doing remote research uh, using telemedicine and actigraphy like Fitbit and uh, Apple Watch, as well as other measures at home, uh, and continuing to plan translational research from basic science findings. So um, there's been a little bit of an eclipse, but the sun is coming out and I think you know going forward, uh, people have been thinking about research a lot in this past year and how to do it. And I think there's going to be a real renaissance uh, in myotonic research in the next year and two. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. I really appreciate the way that you explained all that information. It was very easy to understand <laughs> for a topic that sometimes can be very overwhelming. So I think I probably speak for all of us on that. <laughs> Um, can any of the studies that you mentioned, and we had a couple questions around DN2, um, can any of that be applicable to that DN2, or are there anything, is there anything on the horizon for CRISPR or any interventional clinical trials for DN2? So I, I know that um, uh, there's, they're still actively developing the myotonic dystrophy type 2 mouse. Okay. Um, there's a lot of in vitro, in dish, in lab studies being done on cells derived from myotonic type 2 individuals. Okay. Um, these natural history studies of myotonic dystrophy type 2 are going to help us get those outcome measures. Uh, and I think the same approaches that were applied to these large data sets of um, uh, the primary care records, such as what's done with the UK study, um, are going to be ap applicable to myotonic type 2. Uh, one of the limitations is that the way the diseases have been coded historically doesn't always distinguish myotonic type 1 and type 2 in medical records. And just how things got coded over the past decade switched from something called ICD-9 codes to ICD-10 codes. This is really getting into the details. <laughs> um, but I think there are some things that have made it a little more difficult to completely copy and paste the myotonic type 1 studies into myotonic type 2. And, and the coding is one of them. And also the delay to diagnosis is certainly one of them. The, that long journey mm -hmm. to being told definitively you have myotonic dystrophy type 2 may post-date a lot of the symptoms in these multiple systems that you have. And that can um, be an impediment in, in uh, attributing symptoms appropriately to the myotonic dystrophy type 2. But I think many of these approaches knocking down the RNA, mm -hmm. uh, either with antisense oligonucleotides or with this RNA targeting CRISPR, um, are as applicable in DM2 as they are in DM1. And so I think that's going to be picking up speed as well. Um, yes. But you're right, DM2 has always lagged a little behind DM1 research, mm -hmm. but doesn't mean we can't still use the tools that they've generated. So Exactly, exactly. Um, someone's asking if you would recommend to have children tested for myotonic at the age of eight and five. Ah, so genetic testing. I think you have a talk about genetic testing coming up. We do. She's next. Ah, okay. Can I defer that question to her? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, um, uh, someone had commented a while ago, a couple of years ago, there was a clinical trial for a drug for daytime sleepiness. And this person's just curious, do you know anything about this drug or have you heard anything about it? She's saying that, you know, being tired during the day is truly debilitating. It, it absolutely can be. And that's one of the things Chad Heatwell has shown in his, um, you know, surveys of the population of people who suffer from myotonic dystrophies. Um, it's probably the, the modafinil study. Uh, okay. Modafinil is the generic name for provigil. Um, it, it was a small study, uh, and uh, the difficulty is, is that it's hard to measure sleepiness and fatigue. And uh, one of the things that um, was the outcome of that study was that individuals um, felt like they were doing better, mm -hmm. but it didn't really change their sleep um, pattern. Uh, and I think some of this is, and, and I think you have a talk coming up about uh, sleep and myotonic dystrophy. Yes, we do. I'm sure we'll talk about it more, is that fatigue and myotonic dystrophy is really multifactorial. And if you aren't treating your sleep apnea or nighttime shallow breathing from the myotonic dystrophy, you're not going to benefit quite as much from the modafinil. So you can't overcome poor sleep quantity and quality with a drug, but if you use them both together, you can see some improvement, but there's still, all of these are, you know, helping some. It's really difficult to find something, one drug that fixes all the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a, a, an approach, sleep hygiene, like um, um, Lori said, um, treating your uh, sleep breathing problems, also using a stimulant, but other things, exercise, managing, you know, your thyroid problems, if that's an issue, mm -hmm. all of these things can be factors. And, and if you put all those factors together, it can, it can make a difference. How can you tell if you are having thyroid problems? That's a good question. It's really hard to tell apart from a lot of the other symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. Uh -huh. um, so some of the symptoms of low thyroid function are feeling tired feeling mm -hmm. sleepy, feeling like <laughs> okay. your thinking is slow, gaining okay. weight, having hair thinning. How can I tell? Well, you yeah, just exactly. got to talk to your doctor and get a blood test. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the difference between Provigil and Nuvigil? Oh, I'm going to also leave that to the sleep specialist. I believe okay. one is newer than the other. New Vigil is newer. Okay. <laughs> and it is slightly chemically different. I think it's a, it's a, the shape of the molecule is a little different. Um, molecules can be right-handed and left-handed like people. Uh -huh. um, I think that that is the difference. And the thought is that makes it slightly more effective and with fewer side effects. But um, I also know it's under patent and Modafinil yeah. is about to go off patent. Um, so uh, it's, it's another tool in the toolbox that you really need a sleep specialist uh, or someone to kind of go over with you what would be the best choice for you. Okay. I didn't know that was related to that. Um, last question for you is someone actually typed in that, you know, where does the average person get information on the publications, for example, that you referenced? You know, if they want to be on top of their care and kind of see what's happening, do they have to depend on their neurologist to get them the information from those publications or can they access no. that information on their own? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, no, you can find a lot of this yourself. And okay. one of the tools, and, and it, you know, there's a lot of medical language and technology that's, that's kind of hard to, to dig through. Um, all of us in academia use a, a service called PubMed, Publications okay. of Medical Things, but that's kind of hard to dig through. What I would suggest is um, Google Scholar. Oh, okay. Because um, it will pull up things that are, um, as opposed to general Google, <laughs> um, you can find a whole lot of not very reliable stuff on the internet. I'm sure you all are aware of that. Um, uh, uh, so if you, Google Scholar is, is a bit more reliable. And okay. if there is a link to the actual paper, it might take you to that. 
but it might also take you to an announcement from like a news update or news flash from the MDA website, from okay. Quest Magazine, from uh, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website, summarizing an announcement in ordinary English about the findings sure. of the study. And that can be really helpful is to browse through some of those um, summaries on the foundation uh, and association websites first to kind of give you an overview about what they're talking about um, and then dig into the actual publication. Sometimes you can even find interviews with the author um, on um, YouTube if it's a really big impact study uh -huh. um, or um, other things like Science Friday, uh, uh, on NPR or some other newscast that might be smaller, but, you know, or there might be an editorial published in that same journal about that, that article that helps digest it for you, that an expert in the field read the paper and said, mm -hmm. this is great, or, oh, <laughs> really needs some more to do, or I don't quite believe that. And so you get that expert's opinion in that editorial that often can be published side to side with that article. So those are some things that, if, if you, you aren't familiar with the medical lingo or ways in to kind of get some more detail about it. That's awesome. Thank you for that explanation. I think a lot of people might be looking into that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your presentation today and your time. I know um, you're very busy, so I definitely appreciate it. I hope I didn't run too much over. No, your you are period. fine. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, thanks.